Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Chenari, and this is to- the Tokugawa Shogunate. This is the Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, we do the Tokugawa Shogunate and the Meiji Restoration. So when we left off, we were talking about the creation of the Tokugawa Shogunate. It's going to last 260 plus years. And the most important part about the whole period is no civil war. For the first time in a thousand years, there is no civil war. The lords are not constantly fighting each other. We have a united, peaceful Japan. There are no foreign peoples, tech, or ideas. This is very Japan for the Japanese. This is make Japan great again and make Japan, you know, pure again. In 1628, Christianity was officially outlawed after the after a Christian Daimo uprising, which makes sense because remember in the 1590s, they were executed as disloyal. So it was bad for them. In 1630, all foreigners are kicked out. Especially the Portuguese. Now, this is bad for the Portuguese because this is right with the the decline of their empire. This is kind of the coming of the end of Japan of uh, Portugal. The Portuguese were too connected to the Christian Diamos. Kirishitans, the Christian lords. So since they were traitors, they're going to kick the Portuguese out too. And so trade was limited to the Dutch, who were perfectly happy with this because they replaced the Portuguese in much of East Asia, East Asia at Nagasaki. So the Dutch were replacing Portugal and Spain throughout the East, throughout East Asia as Portugal and Spain declined, as they lost wars in Europe. Still, you know, the, every no, every textbook I've ever had, every class I've ever done on East Asia has always said, oh, the Dutch still traded. There was one place left, Nagasaki, where the Europeans still traded with the Japanese. Yeah and no. Why? Because, and it took a while to look this up, but I found it. In 200 years, from 1600 to 18. 1800 from 1630 to 1830 only 600 dutch ships ever came into nagasaki that's what three a year that's not a lot of trade meanwhile a thousand ships a year from the netherlands was going into the baltic Dealing with the, the Danes and Sweden and Russia and Poland. A thousand ships a year. In fact, part of my dissertation deals with, and then the Dutch show up and ruin all the Swedish plans. Because it was way more important. The Baltic trade with Poland was way more important than the Nagasaki trade. It's nice that it exists and it's good for... um. The, Portu- the Portuguese, it's bad for the Portuguese, they got kicked out. It's good for the Dutch to have an exotic port in the East, in East Asia. And it's good for Japan to kind of have a window on what things are happening out of Europe. If the, if any, you know, if the Europeans invent a laser cannon, that would be nice to have. Like, you know, we, we all admit the cannon and muskets were, were good, right? It helped unify Japan. And so... If the Europeans invent something else, the Japanese would like to have access to it. But they don't really, it's not really, in all practicality, you would never meet a Westerner. You'd never meet a white person. Nor experience European culture. And so, basically, Christianity and Europeans are kicked out of Japan. Three. Three. Zen Buddhism and some Confucianism, but also native philosophies. 
or all part of the Tokugawa shogunate's culture in order to be anti-Chinese. It's going to be Japan is separate from China. Now, that little bit of Confucianism is always, you can never get away from it, especially in East Asia. You can't get away from it. Why? Because it's about hierarchy. Confucianism is about hierarchy. It's about listening to the people who are richer and better than you. So you listen to the emperor. Every emperor likes Confucianism. Yeah, it means they have to do stuff for the people, but they were going to do most of those things anyway, right? Because they don't want revolts. But it also teaches the people, listen to the emperor. They like that. Don't revolt. Listen to the emperor. So they take on a Japanese form of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. Uh, they combine some Confucianism, especially the hierarchy aspect, with native philosophies that are very Japanese and say, yay, we are not, we are not China. Remember when we left off with the, the creation of the Tokugawa shogunate and the war in Korea, where the Japanese armies got kicked out of Korea, they lost and China was still the big dog. Well, now the Tokugawa has to deal with a world where Qing China is still the big dog. So how do you do that? Well, you say, eh. We're different. Our culture is different. And so an emphasis on Zen Buddhism is going to be big. Four, unity is going to be emphasized. And that's going to be created through infrastructure, internal trade, the growth of cities. Growing cities and internal trade equals wealth. You get Tokyo. You get a large city that can then economically combine the farther, farther parts of Japan. Kind of like London, or in some ways New York. It provides stability because it ties, instead of having a hundred small economies, you're increasingly getting a centralized one. Now, the creation of all of that wealth, that internal trade, shipping wealth, moving it, concentrating it in certain large cities, creates income inequality. And the lords, who already had good wealth, but now can't war. Remember that there's no more warfare, right? There's no civil war. So what does a rich dude do to pass the time if he can't go out in war anymore? Well, you do a little bit of culture. To show you're not a peasant. You do some education. To show you're not a peasant. And you have a lot of fun. You play games and have pleasure. And so there's a. There's a emphasis on pleasure palaces. And. Japanese eroticism. Is famous even today in the 21st century. In a very conservative culture. It's also a culture that indulges without because it doesn't have christianity remember it kicked out christianity so it doesn't have all that shame on the body buddhism doesn't have shame in it confucianism doesn't have shame in it or not not sin not not internal shame your shame in confucianism is you didn't do your job you didn't hold up your responsibility so if you're holding up your responsibility you don't feel shame you're doing great especially if you're at the top of the tree the top of the hierarchy and so there's an emphasis on pleasure. Now, who can indulge in pleasure? The rich. The rich could eat special meats. The rich can have lots of girlfriends. The rich could have vacation spots and take the baths at holistic hospitals in the mountains. The rich can do things. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll are the domains of people who can pay for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so the rich start living a different lifestyle. And they start living separate from the poor in a way they didn't before. Japanese lords lived with their peasants. Not like a peasant. They were very clear we are better than the peasants. But they had access. Peasants had access to their lord. 
If there was a dispute, if there was a problem, they had access. Now, hey, they're in Telluride. They're in Aspen. They're gone. They're in Tokyo. They're 500 miles away. With six girlfriends. And so we see this income inequality and a difference in life between the rich and the peasantry, the farmers. All right, so that's good. What about the problems? Well, there's a whole series of problems. The first is that the merchants are doing well, right? All that internal trade, the bringing down of barriers. Now, now you could sell stuff to Tokyo, but you could also sell stuff into Nagasaki or to Yokohama or to... to um, Edo, you could sell things all over the place that before you couldn't because the lords were all having fights with each other. Now, you could do larger amounts of trade, which means more money. So the merchants are doing well, but the farmers and poorer lords, lords who are not tied into trade, do not. Conservative lords don't do well because they stay up on their farms, they tax their peasants, and they act as if it's 1599. They're conservative. They don't want to change. And this new middle class of these merchants that are doing well but have no title creates a social problem. It's creating a class problem. It's creating a culture problem because these merchants are more liberal. They live in cities. They hang out with each other. They're tied to different philosophies. If you hang out with the Dutch, you're going to get Protestantism. And Protestantism is all about making money. Hey, make money. Right? And now you're getting an urban-rural divide. None of these things happened before. It wasn't that Japan was completely peaceful. We know it wasn't. But you didn't have these uh, separations. That money was causing. There was a rich dude in town, the Lord, the Diamo, and there were the peasants, and that was it. And now, now you're getting merchants, and you're getting the people who work for merchants, and you're getting uh, the the shipbuilders, and you're getting, you know, you're getting all of these new jobs that didn't exist before. Translators to talk Dutch to the Dutch. Well, that guy's not a peasant anymore. He's going to want to be paid better than that, but he's not a Lord either. So where does he fit in this new Japan? Two, um, famines, which are fairly common, could wreck incomes, and it happens. The Tokugawa were closed off to Chinese and European trades, which meant it couldn't import food, especially from China. So if there's a famine, a drought, a flood, it really wrecks Japan because there's no, there's no give, there's no leeway. There's nowhere to get extra food from. And so Tokugawa shogunate is always has a problem with how do you feed peasants if things go bad? Because if you can't feed your peasants, the peasants will get rid of the emperor. The peasants will revolt against the shogun. You know, if that's that, that is mandate of heaven, Confucianism 101. Like, if you're a leader, you got to make sure the people are taken care of. If they need help, you have to help them. Otherwise, that whole Confucian bond doesn't work. All right. Well, you'll have to deal with famines. You have a social class problem with the merchants. But these aren't existential threats. No one's going to, no, they're not going to break up Japan. Like the merchants need a united Japan, right? And even the famines are better off with a united Japan. Because if you get a famine in one part, you with a united Japan, you can force the farmers of a different area to export food to the place that needs it, right? You can, you can redirect. And I'm not saying like enslave, like force, like point a gun at people, but like you pay them. And you say, I'm going to give you a hundred dollars for a bushel of wheat and I'm going to, and the government ships it to where it needs to go rather than them putting it on the open market. You know, you can do that by paying more or you could do it by saying, we don't have the money. You have to sell us your, your wheat because we need to send it 
to the south. Right? But that only works if you have a united Japan. An existential threat, a thing that could end Japan, is the Qing conquest of China in 1644. The Manchu barbarians, the nomadic Manchus of the highlands and the forest, united the other nomadic barbarians, the Mongols, the Western troops, the Western tribes, the Western barbarians, and then crossed over, got involved in a Chinese civil war, crossed over the Great Wall, and conquered Ming China. The Ming had stopped trade with Japan. The Ming had turned in on itself. For stability, the Ming had had destroyed their own navy and had stopped kind of looking outside at the world. The Ming had started powerful and had turned inward. The Qing, on the other hand, were militarized. These are military nomadic barbarians. Outside, they're not Chinese. They're Manchus, they're Manchurians. These are guys who you have to worry about. They're, they are allies to Mongols. Remember what the Mongols did to Japan. So these guys, and now they have all of China's economic, agricultural, and cultural power. These are problems. They are the largest economy of Asia. They are the largest army in Asia. But they don't have a navy. They are worried about the Western conquests. Westerners who start showing up in the 1700s, 1730s. No, um, Western contrast is the mostly in the Russians out on Central Asia. Um, and then there's European problems. The British are starting to show up. The Dutch are showing up, replacing the Portuguese. And so the Manchus have the largest economy in Asia, the largest army in Asia, but they're uninterested in conquering the rest of Asia. Now they will create a massive China It will go from basically Afghanistan to Korea. But as time goes on, that pressure will also dissipate. Increasingly, the Qing were happy to dominate China and run China and not conquer the rest of Asia. But in 1644, they looked like they could. And they still might in 1700, in 1750, in 1800. By 1800, they're starting to fade. But until about 1800, it has immense potential power. And if so, if you're the Japanese leadership, if you're the shogun, you got to worry, what are the Qing going to do? Are they going to try to um, do they build a navy? You know, did he occupy Korea? What do the Qing do? So this changes everything. This changes a lot. Because the Shogunate did not have to worry about Ming China for a long time. And now the Shogunate has to worry about China again. Four. The Dutch in the 1820s. Start knocking. You must open up. Now, remember, the Napoleonic Wars have just ended five years earlier. Now, remember, it takes three years to sail from Europe to to East Asia. So these guys who are showing up in 1820 are showing up right after the war. They left Europe right after the war ended. You must open up. The British are coming. And basically, it's... We have no money because we got occupied by France during the Napoleonic Wars. We got devastated. We're poor. 
uh, or we're at least defeated. So the, the 1800s are not kind to the Dutch the way the 1700s were. And the idea is, if you don't deal with us, the British are going to come. And when the British show up, they're not going to be so nice. They're not going to stay in just Nagasaki. So your, your time of being closed, of only having a little spot open to Westerners, is ending. And so you, you better open up now in the 1820s. Because if it's not to us, it's going to be to somebody else. And they're not going to be so nice industrialization was changing power cannon rifled cannon steamships armor rifles all of these things the napoleonic war um was jet fuel for the british economy of industrialization and not only was it making metal stuff military stuff scientific stuff it was making it was changing the stuff, the the consumer goods, suddenly British consumer goods, shirts, pants, were showing up cheaper than anyone could could match because they made them on machines. So instead of making ten shirts a day, they were making ten thousand. So the price of British shirts was much lower, and suddenly peasants could buy this stuff. And so industrialization is starting to change Europe and the British are ahead. In the 1700s, the Russians, the French, the Americans all tried to trade with Japan. No help. Nothing there. And so this is the first time the Japanese are getting pushed to open up their economy, to let more Europeans trade. Now, Japan's lucky because up to this point, they still, they still deal with dying empires, right? They dealt with the Portuguese and then the Portuguese was a dying empire. They dealt with the Dutch who were kind of uninterested and then they became a dying empire. In the 1830s, the British are going to defeat Qing China in the Opium War. Take over Hong Kong. Open up the ports take over the customs houses and the trade taxation. So things are changing. In 1825, to deal with this, to deal with the Dutch, you have the order to drive away foreign ships. It's the kill the foreigner law. Basically, if white people show up in Japan, kill them. Don't let them escape. Don't let them go home. Don't kill them. In 1830, Australian convicted mutineers landed in Japan hoping for freedom. They were arrested and ex executed. So this is taking... So in response to the Dutch, the Tokugawa are, nope, 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 and shutting even, even more clothes down. Don't even show up. We are going to keep the world out. Well, that's not going to work. Especially since the world is changing. In the 1830s, you have the Opium War. So the British are now all over the Pacific and the interior seas. you got American whaling showing up. And you've got European capitalism that wants to sell stuff to make money. So suddenly lots of ships are in the Pacific. They keep showing up in Japan. What do you do with them? You can't murder all of these people. can't murder every American whaling boat. That's going to cause problems. And the British are powerful, so don't anger them. The British just defeated Qing China. Remember the Qing were an existential threat? And here come European white dudes on boats, and they win. How did they win? They got to be powerful. All of this, of course, ends when the American Commodore Perry shows up with four ships, 75 guns, and attitude 
and the emperor and a dying emperor, which meant there was no leadership. What to do? So the first, the first attempt is kick him out. Kick him out. Kick him out of Tokyo Bay. And what did Commodore Perry do? Open fire on Tokyo with his 75 guns and obliterate the port and said, how do you like me now? You want to talk? And so what the Japanese do is sign what's called the Ansei Ansei Treaties, A-N-S-E-I. The Unequal Treaties. The first one will be the U.S., but the moment they sign it with the U.S., the British show up and go, what about me? What about me? What about me? And so they sign one with the British, and the moment they sign one with the British, the French show up. Oh, uh-huh, what about me? And then the Russians show up. And remember, the Russians have ports in the Pacific up in the north of Japan, up to the, not in Japan, to the north of Japan, right? The Russians are building a Pacific fleet. So these are unequal treaties. They all, they open up Japanese economics, but they also say, because remember, white people are racist, Japan is the second power. Japan is the little brother in this. Now, nobody's interested in conquering Japan at this point. It's too far away. It's going to take too much power. Too many troops. And America doesn't want to do that. America doesn't really want a colonial empire. It wants to make money. And so, since the Americans showed up first, everyone else kind of follows their lead. Because no one wants to tick off the Americans. Who, have, who are now fighting a civil war and are clearly, maybe for a small period of time, the largest economy in the world. And if they're not, they're second to Britain. By 1865, the United States is clearly better than France by a lot, better than Russia by an immense amount. It's a, it's a two power world of Britain and the United States economically. And so what does these treaties tell? Japan and the Japanese leadership, imperialism and conquest is coming. It's already happening in China. The Europeans are going to come and they're going to eventually divide us up. The unequal treaties anger the lords and the emperor. You're giving away our power. You just signed over our rights. Now, to be fair to the Tokugawa, what you had 75 guns blowing apart Tokyo. What are you going to do? Godzilla shows up, you, you and lights stuff on fire and says, I want to make a treaty. You say, yes, what would you like, Godzilla? But it doesn't play well in Japan. It goes against J- Japanese nationalism. The Diamo see the Tokugawa as weak. And the emperor is like, dude, you're just giving away my, my kingdom. I can't I can't be important if you're going to give away my kingdom. And this is something many emperors in Africa, in India, will have a problem with when the Europeans show up. It's like, wait, wait, wait. If I, if I don't engage with them, they might invade me. And if I do engage with them, I've given away my power. Like, why do I want to be king? What good is this? So what happens is the Meiji Restoration. Pro-Westernization forces plus the emperor plus guns and training are going to defeat the conservative group. See, the the shogunate doesn't want to change. The shogunate would like to kick everybody out and stay the way it has been for 200 years, 250 years. Westernization will give power to new Daimo, will give power to new lords. That's bad for the, the Tokugawa. And so what happens is a small civil war using Western guns, Western training, a new model army, these pro-Westernization forces with the moral authority of the emperor supporting them, 
win. They defeat the conservative groups. The final of final battles is like the movie, if you watch with Tom Cruise, The Last Samurai. You know. These conservatives knew they were going to lose power because Japan was going to have, if Japan was going to remain independent, it was going to have to change. And that meant a lot of the power structure was going to lose. New people were going to win. But the idea, especially from the emperor, was Japan cannot be China. It has to catch up to Europe. It must industrialize. It must be Britain in the East. And so it's going to have to change. And so what you had was a political civil war in which the liberals win. Had the conservatives won, you'd have Japan would have been China and eventually divided up among the different European empires and weakened. Instead, it is going to borrow from the Europeans to become the only non-European country to industrialize before World War II. So in 1868, the Emperor Komei dies at 36, a young man. And his son, Meiji, ascends the throne at 14. Komei was conservative, but anti-foreign. He forced the Shogun to come to him the first time an emperor did that in 200 years. For 200 years, emperors went to the Shogun which shows the Shogun's more important. This guy's like, uh-uh, you're coming to me. He took an active role in government decisions. He was anti those, those treaties. But he's still pro-Shogunate. He wants to be in charge of the Shogunate, but the Shogunate was keeping the peace. They were loyal to the Emperor. And he is conservative. He doesn't want to change. But he dies. If he had been in charge another 30 years to like his 70s. Till 1900. Japan might have been in a lot of trouble. But a young man comes in and you could take a look if you're watching the video. Look at how they dress. Emperor Komei dresses like a traditional Japanese warlord, Japanese emperor. While the Emperor Meiji is going to act, is going to dress in basically a British uniform. It's going to be differentiated, but it's a Western naval uniform. You can see the different cultures right there. So there are problems. China is defeated and in civil war. It was defeated by Britain in the Opium Wars and it has collapsed into civil war, the Taiping rebellions. America forced Japan to sign the unequal treaties. So Japan is behind and weak, clearly behind and weak. Right? It could not keep the American Navy, four ships, not even the entire fleet, just four ships from entering Tokyo Bay and blowing stuff up. Three, there's no money. Conservatives wanted the Tokugawa lordships to continue. Life was good, but there's no money for rapid industrialization. There's no trade with the outside world. Yeah, there's some places, Nagasaki, Yokohama, Tokyo, but they're few and far between. So, and four, there's no independent power left in Asia. Vietnam's being gobbled up by the French. The Koreans are being protected by Qing China and trying to stay away from the French on the coast. India has been absorbed by Britain. So is, so is Burma. Indonesia by the Dutch. 
So there's no natural allies in East Asia to help. So what does Japan need? What does the Meiji need? They need a new army. They need a new navy. Right? Japanese pirates, for once, will not solve this problem. They need a modern army that can fight the British, that can fight Americans, that can fight, that can beat China and fight Europeans on their own terms. Three, to do both of those, to do one and two, you need to industrialize the economy. You need to build factories. You need to industrialize your workforce. They can't be peasants anymore. That means you need more education. You need, you need training schools. You need science. You need inventions. And four, so you need infrastructure to tie Japan together. So that people can move, that money can move, that resources can move. So you need to make China from a... Uh, early modern state into a modern state from a medieval early modern state into a nation state like Britain, like France, like the United States. And there's no money to do all that. There's no cheat code. So advantages. One, the Japanese were used to copying they had copied from Korea. They had copied from China. They knew. They were used to being behind. You know, you, you live on the border of China for 5,000 years. You're going to be used to being behind. And so they were used to copying things and turning it, making them Japanese and making them better and making them more cultural. Making them work. They didn't just copy and use it without understanding it. Like Oda, he imported the Portuguese guns, right? And then they made guns. They manufactured, they created a Japanese manufacturing for cannon and for guns. So, they have, Japan is used to copying other people's technology and then making it themselves. Incorporating it. Two, Merchants, military officers, and local politicians were locked out of power for 250 years. And they want in, which means the emperor can pull on them. There's lots of people who are willing to work for the emperor to modernize Japan. Because while the Diamo, while the lords may lose out, the conservative, the rich lords, the lower lords have enough money that they can donate, they can tax, they can they can participate, they can be loyal to the emperor, and they could rise. The merchants, the military officers, there's people who are willing. The emperor is now saying, I need to change a lot of stuff. Who's with me? And the conservatives are like, no, 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 because I'm going to lose. But there's lots of people who are like, well, if they're not going to win, if they're going to lose, I'm going to win. I'm in. It's my chance to rise. Like Hamilton, right? He needs a war. If you if you know the Hamilton uh, musical, you know I wished for a war. I knew a war was the only way I could rise up. Well, now we have it. We don't have the war, but we have the rise. We have we are going to have a massive social change, and new people are going to win. Who's who's going to win? And that's going to be this new group of merchants, military officers, local politicians. People who were locked out of power before. Three, high nationalism. You have to save Japan. And that makes sense, right? We have to sacrifice. There's no money. So what do you have to do? Everyone's going to contribute. If you're not contributing, you're making Japan worse. Everybody's in this together. So this is the creation of Japanese. Right as something new, as opposed to we're not Korean, we're not Chinese, as opposed to a negative, it's now a positive. And the emperor can pull on these people because it's it's the Europeans are gobbling everything up. Help me save Japan. Well, who's going to say no to that? 
Well, the conservatives, but even the conservatives can't really say no to that because you, no one wants to be a traitor. You're a traitor, you lose everything. So the use of nationalism by the emperor, by Meiji, is huge in motivating people to sacrifice. And four, war is a good thing. Well, that makes sense because war is the quickest way you get stuff. You conquer someone else's gold supply, you get their gold. You conquer their banks, you take their money, right? You conquer their people, you take them as slaves and make them work for you, right? If you're poor, conquering other people is a quick way of making yourself rich. Alexander the Great did it. The Romans did it. The Assyrians did it. Like the, the Mongols did it, right? And so tied into nationalism, where Japan, we must save Japan, is also the flip side of that. We are better than other people. So why do they have all that stuff that we need? So war is seen as a good thing, as a moral thing, as the thing that will save Japan. Disadvantages. Well, there's no money. <laughs> this is, it's all nice that you have loyal people and they're sacrificing and war is good. You have no money to spend for any of that. You have no money. You have no money to build the factories, to build the navy, to buy the, to to hire the officers from from European armies to teach your troops how to be Europeans. Which brings us to two. There's no education. There's no universities. The education is local and it's religious. It's traditional. Right. It's not physics, it's not gravity, it's not Newton, and it has to now be. So you need people who know Adam Smith. You need people who know economics, a new science. You need people who know how to, how to build a steam engine. Well, how do you learn how to build a steam engine? We got to go to school for that. You have to teach people how to fix the machines that will build the steam engine. You got to go to, you got to make a school for that. Three, Japan has no resources. Like, unlike Britain that has lots of coal and lots of iron, or Sweden that has iron and copper, or Russia that has everything, or America that has even more, Japan is immensely barren of industrialized minerals, of the stuff you need, which means you have to buy it from somewhere else. So you have to buy it from the Koreans. You have to buy it from the Chinese. You can buy it from the Americans. And we will see this with oil. But that makes you dependent on these other countries. Which doesn't work with nationalism. And it costs you money that you don't have. Every dollar you give to China for Chinese iron. Yeah, you get the iron and that's good. It also is a dollar you don't have to spend. It's a dollar that makes China richer. They could build up their army with that dollar. They can build a Chinese university with that dollar. And so the, the problem of no resources is like, you have to industrialize, but how? America industrializing is easy. It's got timber from the East Coast to the Mississippi, and then it's got an, an unbelievable amount of everything under the earth after the Mississippi. Oil, coal throughout, coal throughout the Appalachians, iron, copper aluminum Japan has none of that and finally for Japan has no allies the Europeans are out for themselves the Americans are out for themselves everybody wants money nobody's really interested in helping Japan become powerful the Chinese aren't the Koreans aren't they've been fighting each other for a thousand years there's no allies. There's no one to protect Japan. So what is the solution? 
The solution is westernization. Hire westerners. Send students to western schools. And copy. Bring it back. And so you get a whole bunch of westernization cultural topics that come into Japan. Laws are going to come from Germany. Architecture. The bow arts. That's invented right here in Philadelphia. Architecture. So there are there are 30th Street stations in Japan. Because they went to the University of Philadelphia, learned bow arts, architecture. That's what 30th Street Station is. And they went back to Japan and then built that. Their army was based on the French. Well, in the 1860s, 1870s, the French army is probably the best in Europe. It had been. I mean, the British army is pretty good, but the British army is tiny. It's for colonials. It's for colonial wars. Right? The Navy, the British Navy, on the other hand, is definitely something you want to you want to copy. And so they copy the British Navy. In fact, having Britain build ships for them. Factories. Well, that's the USA. I mean, factory management is is American capitalism 101. It's Carnegie. It's Ford. It's Vanderbilt. It's Rockefeller. I mean, not only did they get rich owning stuff and building stuff, they got rich by making American factories more efficient because they were behind. So they made them more efficient than the factories in Britain, in Germany, in Russia. And so the idea is copy what you can. Copy the best. Send students. Hire Westerners. That brings up a problem. How do you pay for it? The emperor supports all this, which made it difficult to argue. Anyone who went to the emperor and said, well, the taxes are too high. The emperor said, shut up. We need it. I want it. We have to do it. And so that made it difficult for the rich guys to, to argue against. But what it did was increase taxes on the farmers who were 90% of the economy. And that meant belt tightening for a lot of people, especially the conservatives, the samurai, people who lived well as lords. Now they, the money that used to come to them from the peasants is now going to the emperor, going to these Westerners. And think about how much that's going to tick you off. Right? You don't want this. You knew you were going to lose. You knew your life was going to get worse. And here it is. Here's proof. The money that used to go to you so you could have a good holiday Thanksgiving, so you could live high on the hog, so you could send your kids to college. Well, now that money's gone. That money's going to the emperor to build railroad stations like they build in Philadelphia? Like, dude, WTF. And so this belt tightening hits the rich because they have to pay higher taxes too. Right, they're only a small, tiny part of the economy, so they're not hit that hard. But their their position is hit. It's not. It's like America in 1940. It's 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 good to be a rich person. It's not as good to be a rich person as it had been before. To this, we get the creation of Zaibatsu. Super companies tied to the emperor and the great families. So here's the, remember, we're belt tightening the old samurai and the conservatives. Well, if you're smart, you get in on this. The other great family is like, ha ha, I can help emperor. And so they get monopolies. The Zaibatsu, a giant, going to be giant state, not state owned, but state supported companies. And the idea is to not have competition. So you get efficiency. They're near monopolies. In many ways, this is what European companies did. They got they got royal charters. They got royal monopolies back in the 15, 16, especially 1700s. And it's a way for um, the industry to develop because there's little competition. And it's going to have to be efficient. So it's you don't get a lot of internal competition. Now, you go, well, um, competition is good, right? Well, think about who the competition is. 
The competition is American companies, British companies, Russian companies, right? The Dutch East India Company. Like, you got Western companies. You don't need five Japanese companies to also compete. In that side, you need to be big in this competition because the Europeans and the Americans are big. And what they do is go fast and break stuff. So there's massive pollution. They build factories and they don't care about the pollution. In much the same way, this is industrialization in Soviet Russia, in the Soviet Union. It is going so fast that they're breaking things. They're breaking towns. They're breaking villages. They're breaking people. They're breaking the environment so they can make stuff, more stuff, always more stuff and not deal with the costs. They're just going to ignore the costs because it's that or being conquered. There is a race against time. The Miji have to be too big, too industrialized to take over. That's the idea. That European companies will show up and rather trade with them than conquer them. Now, you can tax your peasants and send students to University of Philadelphia. You could hire Westerners, right? And you could tax, you could build Zaibatsu factories and give tax grants to the rich families to... to um, incentivize them to build factories but the problem is is that resource problem you still need iron you still need coal you still need oil you still need copper and aluminum you still need stuff and there's no money and that's where imperialism comes in again we're going to copy the westerners we're going to copy the europeans we're going to conquer other people and take their stuff korea great it's right next door We've invaded it in the 1590s. We're going to invade it again. To the north is Manchuria. The highlands, the hill country. That's not really part of China. I mean, the Qing will conquer China. But for 2,000 years, it's not part of mainland China. It's a border region. It's north of the Great Wall. But it's immensely rich with minerals. What about we take that? What else is there? Taiwan? Hong Kong, well, the British own Hong Kong, Vietnam, Indonesia with the rubber. What else? Where else can we go? Can't go to Hawaii. The Americans own it. So the Pacific is out. China? Do you conquer China? It's got the biggest population. All of those people working for you for cheap would be great. If you enslave the Chinese population, you could get rich off their labor. But how do you control them? The Chinese are three, four, five, ten times the size in population of Japan. How do you control them? That's, that's Sparta's problem. And it was a problem Sparta never got out of. How do you control an enslaved population who will make you rich, but who outnumber you? What do you do? There's not a lot of options for Japan. But they need money. They need workers. They need resources. And that's imperialism. They need to conquer new territories. And absorb that, and absorb that wealth. So in 1895, chaos in Korea. We talked about this. The... Uh, Murder of um, Queen Min equaled an invasion by Japan. Now that brought about war with China, because remember, Qing China was defending was the was the ally to Korea. So of course they're going to defend them, right? They did it before in the 1590s. So they're going to do it again. But this time, the Japanese army has industrialized enough. 
to defeat both the Korean army and then the Qing army that shows up. The Qing army having lost in the Opium Wars and then been devastated in the Taiping Rebellion was in no condition to fight. And the Japanese win. They take Korea. They take Taiwan. They want Manchuria. In 1902, they make an alliance with the British. So they solve the British problem. So they're solving the resource problem, right? Korea, Taiwan. They haven't yet solved the resource problem. You could solve the resource problem if you conquer Manchuria. But that's going to tick off the Russians and China. Well, you beat China. But what about the Russians? The Russians want too. Russians are right on the border with Manchuria. They're not going to just let the Japanese just take all the all that that coal and all that iron and all that copper and all that aluminum. They need it because Russia is so big. The Eastern East, the, the Pacific Pacific Soviet Union, Pacific Soviet Union, not yet. Pacific Russia is its own economy compared to European Russia. So they need it. But in 1902, the Japanese had reached a point that they made an alliance with the British. It was an equal treaty. They were treated as an equal partner. Now, the British don't treat, believe that the Japanese are equal. But they made an equal treaty. We're allies. We're friends. Clearly, the British are more important, but we're friends. They hadn't done that with anybody else. And everywhere else, the British made unequal treaties. The Americans made an unequal treaty. We'll trade with you, but you have to do all these things for us. This, the 1902, the victory in Korea in 1985, but then the 1902 British alliance reflected that Japan got to sit at the big boys' table. They got upgraded. They now were an adult in the room during Thanksgiving. They got to sit at the big kid's table. They might be the poorest of them. They might be the smallest one. They might be the youngest one. But they got to be, they got to sit with Britain, France, the United States, Germany, and Russia. They got got a seat at the table. Now, while this is going on, Russia is looking at this going, WTF, man, we want Manchuria, as I explained. Now, there's six or 8,000 miles between Moscow and the Pacific, but the Russians view Manchuria as, well, it's going to collapse. If China's not going to have it, we'll take it. And what that leads to is a 1904-1905 Russian-Japanese war. The Japanese know this. With the alliance with the British, they know that they won't be attacked by a, another naval power. And the British might actually help them during the war to get them guns, get them money, get them loans. And so what they do is they sneak attack the Russian Asian Navy. It is Pearl Harbor down to a T. Torpedoes and the whole thing. It is a sneak attack. And they sink the Asian fleet, the Russian Pacific fleet. They invade Manchuria. They invade Russian Siberia. And they fight the way a technologically behind people will fight. Mass charges. Uh, it's it's very over the top World War One. Throw themselves at the the guns of the enemy, right? Show the enemy you you will accept death. It's death, but bravery. Japanese um, casualties are horrendous on the Russian front. But the idea was Elon show that you are more manly than they are. Remember, the Japanese do outnumber the Russians out in the east, in the Pacific. They are closer to their home base. 
So to kind of end the war, the Russians send their Baltic fleet, their European fleet around Europe, around Africa, around India, around Indonesia to Japan. By the time it shows up, whatever it is, a year later, nine months to a year later, it is in terrible shape. The men are sick. The food has been horrendous. No one has had vegetables in a while. The ships are leaky. You know, because you've been at sea for a year. And what Japan does is it harbors all of its all of its strength for one knockout blow, and that is the Battle of Tushima. Japan smashes the Royal the Russian Navy and is the first Asian victory against a European Navy since about 1520, since the Turks did it. It is a stunning victory against a military, a larger, more powerful military power. It shows Japan has arrived. It impresses the rest of the European world. They're like, whoa, wow. It also gives us the imprint for what will happen next, right? In the Second World War, when the Japanese attack another Western power, we have the sneak attack on a Western Navy at port, in its home port, right? That will be Pearl Harbor. And then the hope for a super knockout blow where you put all of your chips into one big battle and you try to fight a super battle. That will be Midway. Now, we'll know when we do the World War II video, they will succeed at Pearl Harbor beyond all their wildest dreams. It is 3,000 miles away. It's harder to do. There's radar. So the Americans should have known they were coming. But they're going to lose at Midway. They're going to lose the second battle of Tsushima. They're going to fail to sink the American fleet of what's left. And that was the idea. Once they sank the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima, it's now, let's negotiate. You don't have a way of defeating us now. So we'll just throw our men at your trenches, but eventually we're going to overwhelm you. So what do you want? We get Manchuria, right? Now... The Russians lost, and that's going to be bad for the Russians. That's going to be bad for Tsar Nicholas. He's going to get into the First World War to kind of make up for this humiliation. But he's also dealing with, he's going to deal with a lot of internal problems that make, because you lost, you lost to an Asian power. He's going to eventually have the Russian Revolution, and he's going to get shot with his family by the communists. So it doesn't end so well for the Russian side of the Russo-Japanese war. For the Japanese, on the other hand, it's good. It's a victory. They have won. They're at the big boys' table. They now have access to the resources to industrialize. Does it anger China? Yes. Does it anger the Chin? Yeah, they're from Manchuria, man. They just lost their homeland to their historic enemy. Does it anger the Russians? Yeah, but nobody can do anything about it. In our next episode, we're going to talk about World War I, which is good for Japan. They're going to take Chinese ports away from the Germans. They're going to take more islands away. They're going to make money because by being industrialized, they're going to replace the Europeans economically in East Asia. And we're going to show how that affected culture in the 1920s. How things are great and not so great. And how income inequality and cultural inequality are affecting Japan in the 1920s. 
So we have arrived. We have made Japan into the preeminent power in East Asia. A position it will hold until 1945 and the American victory in World War II. So good luck, be safe, and I'll see you in the next episode.